thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we're really excited to host our second edition of Oxtails and Cocktails. It's a new virtual program that we're doing to gather artists, makers, and thinkers from our Oxville community on every third Wednesday of the month from 6 to 7 um, Eastern time and 7 to 8 p.m. in Chicago and centrally located. But we're really glad to talk with these folks to get stories about their time at Oxbow, their practice, and learn a bit more about them as individuals as well. And they are all in conversation with our executive director, Shannon Stratton. And tonight we're super, super excited to be joined by Gina Valentine, who's one of our alumni, faculty, and we've got Sola in here as well too, who is her right-hand man, who is also an honorary Oxbow alumni, having come up one summer and had a great time up there. I'm gonna read uh, Gina's bio so you can learn a little bit about her before we dive in. So Gina Valentine's interdisciplinary practice is informed by the intuitive strategies of American folk artists and traditional craft techniques and interweaves histor histories latent within found texts, objects, narratives, and spaces. Formally, her practice deals with alternative readings of texts, what logics exists within the illogic of aphasics or among an aporetic oversaturation of meaning. She determines the literary devices and analytical techniques or illustrates the incompatibility of content and substrate. Her practice has received recognition and support from the Graham Foundation, Art Matters, and the Joan Mitchell Foundation. She has exhibited at venues including the Drawing Center, the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Q Foundation, and the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. She's also the co-founder of Black Lunch Table, along with Heather Hart, an oral history, archiving, and a Wikipedia project. Gina received her BFA from Carnegie Mellon and her MFA from Stanford. She teaches in the print media department of SAIC. I'm going to hand it over to Shannon to talk a bit about some of our programming um, that we've been doing and do a little introduction and then we'll dive in with the conversation with Gina. Hi everyone. Yeah, as uh, Sierra so um, graciously introduced tonight, thank you Sierra for coordinating everybody um, here this evening. We've started doing um, some online programming this year just like all arts organizations, I suppose, um, that has included bringing some of our classes online. Um, Gina uh, taught her class in um, data humanizing um, data visualization uh, online this winter, actually, uh, which she'd originally taught in person. Um, but we also have been in the process of developing a membership program um, that is also producing its own kind of online um, uh, talks and workshop series for folks who um, become members. Essentially becoming a member means uh, it's a way of pledging your support to Oxbow. So if you're a fan of what we do, if you enjoyed your time with us, you you wanna help preserve a, a 111 year old arts organization for future generations, um, becoming a member is a great way to help out. Um, but Oxtails and Cocktails is an online program that's for everyone. Um, Oxbow right now, um, I'm realizing with uh, a, a lot of people's help who are uh, on our staff uh, that we have a pretty extensive but pretty disorganized archive. And a lot of the things that, um, a lot of the stories about Oxbow are really um, oral histories. Some of them have been collected. Some of them just sort of circulate around um, amongst um, people who um, have been participants or are great lovers of the place. So. In some ways, Oxtails and Cocktails is a really fitting way to start capturing some of those oral histories in the now by having a conversation and recording it and um, doing that with um, the vast range of people who have been associated with Oxbow over our history. So we refer to everybody who participates in Oxbow as alumni, whether it's faculty or student or fellows or visiting artists or resident artists. So when we talk about our alumni, we're talking about this really um, you know, pretty large group of people that span many, many generations of the organization and our staff as well. We start, we include them in our, our kind of concept of alumni. So um, as Sierra said, uh, every third Wednesday of the month, um, there'll be a different conversation um, with somebody um, from that larger Oxbow community about their work, about their stories about Oxbow, and um, we'll record them and collect them 
um, for our own archiving purposes and um, also invite everybody to join us to have a cocktail, um, which is selected every time by our guest as well as our intro music. Um, so this evening, Gina, such pleasure to get to talk to you. Um, you decided to send a recipe out for a hot grog. I guess grog's always hot, but, <laughs> but grog. <laughs> um, tell us about your cocktail choice. Um, well, when I was living in Philadelphia right after undergrad, we, we tried to stay warm and to keep from getting scurvy. And so grog was very popular. Um, and I think back then we used to make it with rum and bourbon because why not? Um, <laughs> stay extra warm. Um, I recommend making it with one or the other, um, with like whole cloves, with some cinnamon stick, but it's kind of like whatever, it's like a, it's like a, it's a very easy thing to make. It's like whatever, whatever you can find. Exactly. Whatever you can find. Whatever like we had to just get plain apple juice. Well, it's like, it's not apple cider, but it's like, yeah. More of apple juice. Yeah, it's a stretch to call it apple cider. And we just had to put a bunch of <laughs> flavoring in it. Yeah. <laughs> so the fact that I kind of made it with whatever I could find this afternoon means that I did meet the grog challenge. Um, <laughs> cool. Because I have poured spiced rum and an already pre-made like apple cider iced tea thing together and then put some nutmeg in it. Yeah, I'm sure it turned out fine. And I think, yeah, the key is having some like vitamin C in it to, you know, keep. That might be missing, but. <laughs> orange slices. Maybe. I do have some oranges. I should have thrown, I thought I should have thrown some orange slices in there, but it feels very good on a cold winter night. Um, thank you. Cheers. Yeah, cheers. Through the camera to everybody. Cheers to you, Gina. Cheers to you, Sylvan, and everyone here tonight. Cheers. You Whatever you're doing. Put some orange juice. Oh, yeah. yeah, actually, sometimes juice. people put orange juice and in grog too. But I, I sent Sierra the the Wikipedia entry on grog, which is ah. linked to Glug. Um, so if anybody's interested in reading the, the history of from whence grog came, it's out oh, there. Sarah Klugage is definitely interested. <laughs> She's like, <laughs> There, Sarah. <laughs> um, and you uh, you uh, welcomed us here tonight with um, Boards of Canada. Um, that's a prompt that um, emerged out of our first Oxtails and Cocktails to invite folks to choose some music to listen to as we get together. Um, and I just sort of suggested things that folks have been listening to this listening to in the studio this year, but that's not a hard like requirement. Um, tell us about your choice, Gina. Yeah, um, I think I listened to a lot of Boards of Canada back in the day, like in undergrad and grad school. And then I was thinking about the, the image that Sierra had chosen of me and Denenge on her, her bicycle built for two. Um, but yeah, it just seemed perfect. And also I've had that song stuck in my head for like weeks. It just somehow like took a deep dive back into Boards of Canada. I like that you brought up that the last song was Cocteau Twins. I've been listening to a lot of Cocteau Twins this year too. Um, and that's a thread running through our oxtails and cocktails is. <laughs> it's about, right. And I think at the beginning of the pandemic, there was like a lot of like, it's a lot of like tricky. It felt like very like pre 2000, like end of world vibes back in like May. <laughs> yeah. Like Yes, all of the kind of like late '90s music was mm -hmm. uh, was really applicable. It had the right feels, maybe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely um, nostalgic for a previous end of world times, maybe. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, retrospect, like, yeah, maybe all the systems will crash, but yeah, this is a whole <laughs> level. Like Y2K, where nothing happens, like that's a, a kind of a hope, but yeah, uh, where the right things happen. So um, I'm going to just prompt us first to talk about um, how you came to Oxbow teaching this class in Undata, humanizing data viz. You don't say visualization in the title of the class. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's how you started. That's your first relationship with Oxbow, or had you been to Oxbow under other circumstances prior to teaching? No, I'd actually never been to Oxbow before that. Um... And neither had Sylvan. <laughs> and we were both really excited for the opportunity to come there. Um, you know, it's a storied place. I made a lot of stuff. A lot of lore. 
um, <laughs> and uh, Inundata. Actually, coming up with a title was really fun. I had a bunch of really quirky titles um, lined up. Um, one of which I think was like, um, are, "Are you my data? Um, come to data." Uh, is that Apex Twin album? Um, yeah, and then data just came kind of like encapsulated everything, like being at once like super saturated with data, being inundated, but then also thinking about like um, kind of unraveling some of that and you know, really looking at things and thinking about like what kind of making that might entail and like how to bring that into like the actual history at Oxbow. Yeah. Had you um, had a sense prior to coming to teach that class about the um, archives that you might access locally or, or at Oxbow? Or did you kind of discover that upon coming up to campus? Oh, um, so that's kind of like the research for the class. Like, I, you know, like a lot of my work is really site specific. Um, you know, I used to work with a lot of found objects and did a lot of like meditations on the spaces that I was working in before ever creating anything. So like going to a residency meant spending a lot of time in thrift stores and trying to figure out like what, you know, what people shed, I guess, <laughs> for lack of a better word, but what kind of like, um, like material artifacts people left behind. Um, right. It's a really good way to get a sense for like what a community is. Um, so, uh, but the, the Sagatuck Historical Center now, I think, not the society. Yeah. yeah. Um, they, it's such a tiny community, community and so, so well documented. Um, they're, material archives are really well documented. And then they also have like a digital archive that archives things that are not physically in the space, but you know, things that people have sent them photos of or like stories that people have shared online. Um, it's kind of incredible. It's like maybe a model for like super archiving in other larger communities. Um, so yeah. They have a little bit of Oxbow history in their archive um, that is, not entirely different than than maybe some of the things that we hold in our own archives, but they have some um, they have a nice box of, <laughs> of <laughs> oh, ephemera, which is kind of great. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the thing that you said about being interested in how what people shed, mm -hmm. uh, I when you said that, I just thought about how Oxbow really is kind of a a bit of a repository for some shedding at the end of every year. There's a there's little hot spots all over the campus where there's accumulated things, and the Kim has got like <laughs> random clothes that people add to the sort of the tickle trunk of costumes. And they might have they they might have found my costume. Oh yeah, Sullivan's costume vanished, which was a mystery because it was like who else is wearing size five clothing? Oh, like five year old clothes. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, if you see it, it's a purple leotard. Um, oh, yeah. I have a bigger one, but it's like size 10. <laughs> it could fit, it fit you. But just like thinking about shedding, I mean, I think actually Danny Miller, um, who Sylvan collaborated with, and I have like some images to show of that. I can but, show you the little one. Wait, Sylvan, yeah. Um, I, uh, you know, I'd known him as like our, our shop manager in print media and you know as far as shop managers go he's on the chill side but it was really a great opportunity to get to know him as like a person up at oxbow it's just like people just shed their stress when they come to oxbow it's a very different vibe than in the city here I, you know what so then i have a picture of it okay mm, okay okay but i don't want to show the live version of it also I like how Sylvan emerges and disappears into the into Lake Michigan. <laughs> okay, Sylvan's gonna take care of some business and be back soon. <laughs> I'll be back soon. Danny Miller, Print Studio. 
you were saying. Yeah, so those guys, they, they got to spend more time together because Sylvan had uh, an amazing sitter who came up with him, um, or with us, I guess, and they went adventuring around Sagatak and they got to go on the, the pole. What's it, toe? Are you on this Oxbow Zoom? On the, uh, <laughs> Bobby, mute your mic. <laughs> on, the, uh, <laughs> on the chain ferry. Yeah, so they got to go on the chain ferry and like checked out all these cool sites around town um, and like hiked up, forgetting the name of it, that very long staircase. Um, in the oh yeah, the stair, the, um, Mount Bal the Mount Baldy stairs, yeah. Yeah, but he, I think he did every single class there, <laughs> including glass blowing, or pouring, um, there was like a hydrocal class. Um, he spent a lot of time in the clay studio, I think in part because they had like a, a semi-daily ice cream social. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, but also spent a lot of time with Danny Miller who, you know, um, showed him, you know, in five-year-old terms, like how to create a litho. And so they you know, collaborated on making this litho together, which ended up being auctioned off. Um, mm. Yeah, I have a little image of that I can share too, but. We should make sure we have one for our archive. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's just like totally different vibes. I think when he was teaching online, you know, we tried to like, we tried to bring that much, bring that into the class as much as possible. Cause you know, you're not on site, but like slower pace and taking time to just spend time with each other I think was really important um, yeah how did you do that uh that's a good question um I wish that there had been more time and I think that the students also wish that we had had like you know I don't know I don't I don't I, I have thought about like how I would redo it but we spent the mornings together and then you know in the afternoon there was a lot of emailing um, and some like one-on-one -on -one meetings and they met with each other. Um, and, but I would say that, you know, being online enabled us to bring in a student who was in Shanghai and a student who was in Beirut. Um, and there was another student who was outside the city. There was a student who was in the south, suburb, south suburbs of Chicago, but, um, you know, that wouldn't have been possible if we all had to be on site, so. Yeah, that was positive. Yeah, yeah. There is some. It it's it was an interesting thing for us to explore, like how to bring our education model online when it seems to be so much about site. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know that a lot of the slides that you wanted to share, sort of this first round, include student work. So maybe I'll I'll turn it over to you um, for your for this sort of first like like slide presentation stuff oh, that you yeah. have. Sure. It's funny that Sylvan just left a <laughs> this part has him in it. Um, and I guess folks who are out there in the audience, like feel free to interject with questions or comments or anything. Um, so when we were there, um, I don't think I have a whole lot of images of this, but we did uh, a day long digitize a -thon. Um, because a lot of the Oxbow archives exists in you know, gig these gigantic boxes, many of which live in the office um, in Chicago. A lot of it hasn't been digitized. Um, so just going through lots of old pictures. Um, oh, there's some, there are some other great ones that I should have shared too, but pictures of like, you know, the weekend parties from, you know, 50, 60 years ago were pretty incredible. So we found this one and it seemed perfect because of course it says Oxbow offers art in Sylvan setting. <laughs> um, so we, when we were there, we did a field trip to the historical center. So I was taking the bus. Um, oh man, Sylvan should have stayed. <laughs> Let me see if he wants to come back. Maybe he'll come back. Um, we've done a number of residencies together. Um, 
Me and Sylvan, we did the Joan Mitchell residency, uh, Marble House. Um, I don't think of where else, but basically he just comes everywhere and there's always these environments where children are allowed and then there are environments where children are actually welcome. And Oxbow is very much a place where children are welcome. Um, he used to get up early to be part of the work crew. Um, if he were here, he would tell you that one of his favorite things was taking out the garbage. I guess they went around on a truck and would collect all the garbage and then throw it off the truck into the dumpster. Um, Bring it back for that if you want. <laughs> <laughs> this is his crew. Um, that's Eli. Eli was in my class. Um, I think he met everybody on campus way before I did. Is the clay studio. Mackenzie Salisbury, who's at Flaxman, came up to visit to give a presentation to my class. Um, we should just want to talk about it's about uh, cataloging systems in the library, but then also talking about um, wayfinding. We were thinking about wayfinding like within catalogs, but also wayfinding within um, the landscape and that actually turned into a really fun day project. Um, Sylvan volunteered to give Mackenzie a tour of campus. Uh, of course, the dance party, I think that was like 90s rave theme. Um. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sylvan at the Chip and Dipper. Um, hopefully that is still happening. Um, I know Danny is sadly retiring this year. Um, but hopefully he'll continue to come up to Oxbow. So I think this is after they made their print. Um, but the Chip and Dipper is like a, a social open print studio night where folks can come in and look at the production, but then also learn about um, how people make prints. Uh, that is the print that Sylvan wanted to show you at that auction. I think, can I show a quick video? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he had to skip town tonight. I gave him a hard time about it. You can bet on that, but he's on the way to Santa Fe, so you know we can't uh, fault him for that too much. But Danny helped Sylvan make this beautiful lithographic print right here this week at Oxbow. So check this out. Sylvan's showing it to you. Look at the beautiful inspiration that this piece can provide. Twenty dollars. Who's gonna start this? Twenty dollars right there in the white. Okay, thirty. Thirty right there. Thirty on the side. Sorry, my peripheral vision is like not as a snap yet. I'll try to incorporate that into my view here. Do I have forty? Who's got forty? Who's got forty on this beautiful litho? A six-year-old made a litho, people. <laughs> forty dollars. Forty dollars in the white. Fifty. Fifty. Do we have sixty? We just go right to sixty here. Sixty. All right. Fifty going once. Oh, oh, 60, 60, 60 on the side. We got 60 on the side coming in. Okay, do we have 70? Oh. 70, I see 70, white sweater. 80, 80. I'm trying to look around, make sure I don't miss anyone. 80 on the side, all right, we have 90. We have $90. $90 for this beautiful black and white abstract litho. Okay, we've got 80 going once, 80 going twice. Oh. We got 90, we got 90, swooped in. All right, so we want to go up to 100. Is this a thing more? 100! It's amazing. Oh, I love it, Sylvan. Okay, I'm gonna continue now. Okay, bye. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> bye. bye. Oh, I need that. Hot cocoa. Oh, here you go. Don't run. Okay. Not hot cocoa, sorry. We had to. Oh. Um, oh, wait. So the postcards, which is something that we, we did there as a class project, but we also did um, virtually, or, yeah, in the virtual session this year, which was really fun. So it's a project called Dear Data, 
um, which is the project of George Lupi and Stephanie Presovic, both of whom are designers. Um, they have a whole project online. Their website's really amazing. But then there's also a book called Dear Data that they spent, uh, I think, a year um, documenting aspects of their lives that were otherwise mundane um, and creating a postcard at the end of the week to send to the other person. Um, and they were kind of interested in like how to, you know, get back to using their hands, right? And thinking outside of the constraints that they'd kind of placed on themselves as professional graphic designers. Um, and so this is from our, our whiteboard in class where we talked about what we were going to document each day. Um, so caffeine intake, these are a lot of things that we didn't document. Bad smell, bad juju is something we documented. Um, if you have a nervous tick, yeah. uh, body contact. Um, this one was fun. Postcard is primary resource. There were a lot of really gross ones. <laughs> I just <laughs> sat down and soaked up the day. Um, when something is funny, and so here are some of them. Just, oh, I think these, the ones that I'm going to show you here are the ones that we did at the very end, which were um, exquisite corpses. And so we just sat at a table for a couple hours and we had, I think, 60 seconds to write something and then pass the card and then you would continue. And on the other side, we did like a um, more traditional mm. exquisite corpse. There's like toast disco happening there. Toast is a big deal at Sky or at Oxbow. Um, mornings are not boring. And everybody just sent they um who were the uh, folks that they were addressed to? Did they send them back to whoever they wanted to send them to or back to themselves or? Um, yeah, we all sent them to each other. So to everybody in the class, I think everybody ended up getting one of these. Right. Yeah. This guy. What was that guy? Man. The other figure man. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of oxtails in your poster. <laughs> Toast, the pricker man. It'll be available in tiny lapel pins, by the way. <laughs> A lot of mosquitoes out there. Um, and so this is the this is our last day of class. We're missing some folks. Um, I think Diana had put on her beach background. So this of course is this the online version. Um, so took a class portrait. Um, oh, let's skip over to Hmm, I'll just, I'll just show you one of these. Um, show you Tessa's. So, of course, because these are all being all sent from all over the world, I've gotten half of them. I think everybody's getting two, and we also each sent one to the Joan Flash um, Artist Book Collection. And of course, April Sheridan was really excited to get copies. So I asked everybody to photograph or video record their postcards before they popped them in the mail. So we'd have a, a record of everything that was sent. Um, yeah. You can see they're all quite different. So this one, we, all the times that we said no instead of yes during the day, I said no to my cat when he tried to open the door to the kitchen. I said no to a cup of really, really hot tea. I said no to my thought of going outdoor to buy potato chips. Mm. So I think, I don't know, I think this project translated really well, the, you know, the kind of slowing down and thinking about what's happening. And ways to stay connected to people. Yeah, definitely. Really? It's not just connection online, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which I guess is the, you know, the, the thing that I notice about how you talk about the class is this, um, 
uh, how data doesn't convey lived ex might fail to convey lived experience and that's that is the kind of foundation maybe to the way you teach this class is trying to um or encourage students to examine data in a more embodied way that, yeah definitely mm -hmm. and to think about other systems too um this is a an image i think this is Sarah Gray's work? No, this is Madeline Aguilar's work. Um, um, and this is actually the, the afternoon project that they did after um, Mackenzie came to visit with us and we were doing wayfinding, just thinking about reorganizing spaces on campus and building guides for how to navigate those spaces. Um, so hers is actually, I think it's the bookshelf on the second floor. Ah. <laughs> so, was reorganized this way and then there's a guide for how to use this organization so foundation is part of inconsequential yes. That's right. <laughs> forms of library science yes, actually <laughs> um and this one's tara and he re they were reorganized uh, some chairs at a table, but then was thinking about like how, you know, placement at a table could relate to like social standing. Um, so some chair needs more power. Chair for the chairman. Oh, and this is me. I <laughs> the toast station is always kind of a mess and it like it drove me kind of a little bit crazy because there were things that I needed to find and I can never find them. So I was like, I'm gonna make a system here. Um, <laughs> I could not find the map that I made for it, but like, you know, little things like all of all of that kind of hot sauce belongs together. Mm -hmm. There's multiple shirachas. Sometimes there were more than two and there were why why? <laughs> In case somebody steals one of them. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, I kind of felt like it was like it was a little bit of sacrilege just because it had like its own kind of organic form. Um, and it's hard to see here, but these are like recipes that people had made for different toast combinations like butter, cinnamon, sugar, I don't know, drizzle of honey on top. Sounds good. But you made a map for the toast bar. Yeah, I, I put it over here. So if it's still there, <laughs> maybe Sarah, you can take a picture. <laughs> <laughs> locate that toast bar map. <laughs> yeah. There it says yes. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, and I think that's that's it for the scow stories. The oxtails part of the, the oxtails, yeah. Um, so before we go in deep, we do the deep dive into your work, um, will you talk a little bit about what, um, if there is a moment or just it sort of how you might trace this, uh, point where you, um, just like got engaged with the concept of data visualization and wanting to critique it or, mm -hmm. uh, teach it and critique it, um, and I think, it, you know, obviously how that intersects with your own art practice, which we're, we're going to get into now. Um, but yeah, I have, I, I want to hear about sort of where you're, where, where you started with that, that interest, like what the, yeah, what the sort of um, gateway drug to <laughs> data visualization <laughs> and critique of it was. Um, I have some follow-up questions about that, but I'll leave it there. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um... I feel like it, maybe it comes back to the language. I see Lordy Rodriguez is here. Hey, Lordy. Um, we went to grad school together. Um, I bring this up because while I was in grad school, I took a like a public speaking class because I have always been kind of quiet spoken, um, sometimes a little mumbly, um, but I also speak multiple languages. So I think about like, you know, miscommunication, mistranslation, um, potential for misunderstanding as it comes out of like language, um, not saying the right thing or choosing not to say a thing. That was one postcard that we did actually, like all these times during the day where we thought to say something, but you know, just like kept it. Like, when does that happen? But also thinking about why that happens. 
Um, I think as far as like data goes, so um, maybe it was after Sylvan was born. And um, just thinking about how world events were often illustrated through like these little graphics that like summed up like this, these are the resources in the city. Oh. It's like, uh, you know, this is how many people have been, you know, subjected to state violence. And it's like, this is like dots. It doesn't make any sense. Um, or, I don't know, we're living in, you know, places where a speed bump is called a speed bump or places where it is called a traffic table or places where it is called a speed hump. Like it's the same thing. <laughs> They'll have like a little little diagram that's supposed to help you like navigate that. Um, so there's always these places for confusion. Um, so it's sort of interesting. It's it's like uh, I mean, and we'll get into this. You know, your um, investment in working with text as a medium, I guess. Um, but it's almost like data is supposed to, data visualization is supposed to be a way that um, complex ideas are communicated more easily, or might be potentially like a, a viewer or a reader might be more receptive to that content and the lost in translation thing wouldn't happen, but you're struck by how it actually is this other kind of like loss because it's it's so disassociated. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it's so disassociated from the lived experience. And so it's it's interesting just to think about, you know, well, how most forms of communication fail us in in fail us at um, fail humans at at really being um, understandable to one another, maybe. Mm -hmm. Definitely. There's this, um, if Sylvan was here, he would tell you um, about, uh, gosh, what, I can't even remember what Instagram account that was on, but it was um, like one of those caution signs and there's a man who's running and then there's like the squiggly lines underneath. And I think that subtext is like, there may be snakes like obviously the squiggly lines are supposed to be water, but if you didn't know, you would, might read them as snakes. Um, yeah, there's just there's just not so much room for. Um, sorry, I'm actually know where I was going with that. Um, there's a lot of room for confusion. Um, I guess I was also thinking about like teaching this person language and teaching him what things mean. Um, and why things are called the way that they're called is, I don't know if all children ask are so curious about etymology, but like, why is this thing called this? I don't actually know. It would make more sense if it was called this other thing. Um, like he's, um, he just learned the word portmanteau and this is like a whole like, like eye-opening word for him because it's like, it's like this, uh, like a sandwiched word and in other languages like German or like Swahili sandwich words are I think more common yeah. like you have your, your your noun and thing the verb that acts on it and like the tense and like maybe the place and the gender it's all kind of squashed together um but German yeah German mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in this <scene. laughs> like the, the home of all of many a portmanteau yeah so you you mentioned that you spoke several languages and so um although this wasn't a um uh prepared question on my list um i'm curious if that you know the um having knowledge of many languages was what led you to text as a kind of medium in your art practice mm. or if that's maybe the trajectory um, or if if your just general passion for language and for text was also the thing that attracted you to learning multiple languages? Is it just a facility? Mm -hmm. That's an interesting question. I mean, I was thinking about like multiple languages, but also the ways, the different ways that we communicate with each other in English, right? Um, code switching, for example, like, um, or the way that one speaks to their elders, right? Versus the way that one speaks to a child. 
um, you know, those are like different uh, ways of using this same language, um, but in very different ways, right? I think that's also really interesting to me. Um, yeah, maybe going back to grad school again. <laughs> this is something I just recently shared with my um, class was that I think in grad school, I felt like, you know, just everything that I need, I had to also create this lang like spoken language or written language to explain its being, right? Um, in some cases, it felt like excusing it, like this is why I made this thing, <laughs> which seems really strange, but it also, it became kind of, um, at some point, I think it became like burdensome, burdensome, like, why do I have to make all this, like, why do I have to tell you what it's about? Like a second explanation for something that already is a visualization of, of an idea. Yeah, and of something that, like, exists as an object or because it can't exist in words and so I think it made sense to bring like the words into the object too or to have like at least like a, a writing practice alongside the object making process right yeah I think that's a um I mean it, one of the things that struck me when I was reading your own writing about your work was um your writing about about incomprehensible um like not being unable to empathize in as you're writing about your own work a couple of pieces being unable to empathize emphasize empathize with mothers whose um black sons had been killed by the police or by gun violence mm -hmm. and you were writing about um dealing with something that's incomprehensible um i think both the action but also horror and grief as sort of incomprehensible emotions to mm -hmm. kind of between people and I, I think that got me thinking about, you know, the fact that that maybe comprehension is a really ambitious, you know, idea for humans in general. We talk about something being comprehensible or comprehension, but like there's probably no such thing as total comprehension because there's, you know, such a vast, um, there's just such a vast gap between people in terms of how they experience the world. Yeah, yeah. Um, our bodies are different, you know, bodies experienced is, you know, dragging with it our own histories and our own experiences. So that, that comprehension gap was something I, um, I've just, it really resonated. I mean, I think so you were writing about your work, so you're making a statement about an object that already exists, but, but I was, I, I, the, the, this idea of how just completely, how unable we are really to fully empathize, um, I thought was a, I, a, yeah, I, I think that 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 deeply resonated with me. And then how, in your work, you tackle that by making objects that disintegrate or eat themselves or um, disappear or um, but are fugitive. Sort yeah. of. Yeah. Um, I'm. I'm <laughs> there's there's a lot of things to talk about with your work. So I'm. <laughs> I'm already like, oh my goodness, we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna run out of time. So I I do want to give you the chance to put up images and say something. No, there's a couple things that are like I think. Um, you know, as far as like teaching a a class like and then data and focusing on like like attempting something like empathy for the experiences that are you know illustrated there. I mean, I think that's maybe that's the whole the whole point of that class. Um, oh, I'm forgetting her name. There is a Bay Area artist who uh, I, I'll, I'll look it up maybe in a bit, but she had done um, this correspondence with uh, a person who was serving a life sentence, and the majority of it was um, in solitary confinement, but. It was called Herman's House, is the movie, um, Herman Wallace. And the gallery piece was like a reconstruction of a solitary confinement cell. So people have some idea of like what a four by six cell felt like, right? Like no amount of having that drawn out or like written out will ever give you the same kind of association to it. And if, you know, unless you were actually in a space where you could see your body within that space. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, understanding I think is a lot to ask for. Maybe like at least trying to be empathetic or compassionate, maybe. Yeah, and that seems like that 
that being able to conjure that empathy really comes from um, making contact with the body. I think mm -hmm. like saying that if you can feel the space, you reach that empathy much quicker than than trying to interpret it through like the symbol, like text as a symbol. Yeah. I guess that's maybe one thing I was thinking about with your work that, and, and you write about it a little bit differently, but the gap really between the symbolic and the, and the real, like there's this huge space between those two things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Will you talk a little bit about, I well, have two questions. I well, maybe actually should ask this first one though, before I ask the second one, because the second one's a process question, which I think is the right one to ask before you show us more images. Um, but you're teaching a class called Inundated, um, and you're making this work um, that is very material. The 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 text print, the text-based prints, or the prints of text. Um, and I've got a process question about that to ask next. But I'm wondering what your thoughts are about um, how much kind of emotion is being uh, emotion is being communicated online right now when it comes to this this kind of thinking about grappling with um, empathy that in in formats or platforms or situations where there's not a lot of embodied experience. Mm -hmm. uh, totally a personal question because I find it very frustrating that so much happens in a social media platform that is asking for empathy, but they're very, it's a very sort of concise minimalist way of communicating the human experience. And it's becoming more and more like branding or advertising. It's sort of becoming more like data visualization in a way, you know, <laughs> lines with like two lines of text, you know, pair it with one image or something. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your thoughts on that? And are, are you, do you have thoughts on like what we're losing right now in our, um, capacity to find empathy with so much happening across a screen um, on our personal devices or yeah yeah well it's, I mean my son is doing second grade online right now and they, yeah I do think about that a lot um you know he knows his I'll get to me <laughs> like he knows his classmates from who they are in class like as they're you know focused on paying attention and doing the work, but there is no, there, yeah, there's no like, there's no physical contact. There's no, like, there's no, there's none of the in-between spaces. There's just like all programmed, um, pro all programmed engagements or all planned engagements. Um, yeah, I was thinking, Actually, there's been a number of articles just about like this, this sort of, I always call it gray space, but the space that's between events, right? Where you're just like hanging out at the bus stop or walking down the hall to your class um, or whatever. Like it, they seem really mundane and, or like commuting <laughs> and being stuck on Lakeshore Drive. Um, those are things that I miss, which is weird. Um, but there are also the times where you might run into somebody and have a conversation rather than having, you know, this time where you're like, hey friend, we're gonna meet <laughs> on FaceTime and talk, right? And we're gonna talk from here to here. I'll send you an iCal invite. I mean, um, it's like such a different way to be a human. Um, as far as like, yeah, what's lost in empathy. Yeah, I don't, I don't really actually know how to process all of that right now. I'm thinking of all of the, you know, the many petitions and letter writing and the reckoning that so many institutions are doing right now. Um, and I mean, I'm also thinking about like how much, how depersonalized these engagements are like between the constituents and the institutions because mm -hmm. you know behind the screens it's not like an actual person that maybe you run into when you're getting coffee right mm -hmm. yeah so yeah i don't i mean it's like scheduled empathy i mean <laughs> uh, what you said though about you know it happened things happen between here and here 
announcements are made, like a program happens and, and that gray space, I mean, even, I mean, I think so much what makes culture such a rich place for, you know, generating ideas and, and, and action and, you know, political conversation and empathy is that all the gray space that happens at the end of a program, you know, that we're gonna, if we were in real time together, this would end, people would stand up and have a drink and they'd talk to each other, we'd maybe go out for a drink, but it would like spill over into life and there's no, there's no spillover anymore. There's no chance for sort of that, like those sort of um, tendrils, I guess, to grow out of yeah. them. Absolutely, the stuff, yeah, the outside of the lines stuff. Um, but at the same time, I mean, for parents or those who don't normally, can't normally venture out in the evenings, this is kind of like, this is kind of a great thing <laughs> that everything is just online. They can come to a meeting at nine o'clock at night, no problem. Yeah. Um, and I would also say that I've like been able to connect with a lot of people that I wouldn't normally have just because of, yeah, because the way things are presently, so. We have to figure out a way to meld both of these things together. <laughs> <laughs> that would be ideal, yeah. What is, yeah, what is gray space in a digital, in a digital communication? Yeah. About Kamau's talk, was that last month? Maybe it was two months ago, but he said something like- Oh, when the, when the faculty did their short talks, yeah. yeah. And he's like, yeah, these chat threads I'm on, like the chats are really giving me life right now. Like that's, that is where the gray space has moved. It's like somebody has this experience and they want to share it with the group and people that they would normally see out in the world but then you just have this chat about it. You don't see them, but I mean, it's starting to feel, yeah, it's one of my favorite things right now. Um, yeah, maybe that's where the gray space is presently. Um, yeah. I'm gonna let you show some work so that I can ask other follow-up questions. <laughs> sure. um, I might, I haven't written anything. Um, painting school did not end, but I, I liked this image. Um, this some ink, I like, so I make this iron call ink. Um, this is kind of what it looks like when it starts corroding. It's very cool. Um, so yeah, you're asking about language. I think it all kind of goes back to this. I wish that I had known this word like 20 years ago, I think my life would have been very different. <clears throat> but aporia, it's like, I mean, there's so many different meanings for it. Um, but I like to think of it as a mass of information in the process of gaining legibility or in the process of competing with other information for legibility. So like a cacophony of voices. Uh, that is Sylvan and I, I think he's three. We were at a monster drawing rally. And you uh, have iron gall ink with you. Yeah. <laughs> People were like, what is that stuff? Um, and iron gall ink eats away at certain papers. Yeah, um, it eats away at all paper. But all paper. Yeah, but some paper more quickly than others. I think just because of how porous some paper is and um, yeah, it's like cotton based paper goes pretty quickly. Flax paper doesn't seem to corrode very quickly. Um, this is actually a piece from grad school. Um, it's a lot of writing. I think there's eight of them. Um, they were mostly stream of consciousness text. You just write until I got to the bottom. Um, or two of those. Oh, this was actually a two-part piece and it was all the text that I had written in those two years. <laughs> oh, all of your essays or all of your, yeah. oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> For some reason I had, I misunderstood that when I was reading about this work that they were, that it was automatic writing. 
Oh, yeah. So the first series here, this one is automatic writing. That's automatic writing. Okay. Yeah. And then we all of you. Oh, yeah. I mean, I guess here I was also just I was interested in impermanence too. It's like I said all these things, but they're not, you know, none, nothing static. I mean, right. Nothing set in stone. Um, and this is what happened to it after I graduated. I wrote it all on the floor and in quite a wet erase marker. We had like a, a screening and an opening and a very long dance party. And it was all completely obliterated the next day. Huh, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for this conversation. I realized so many things about my work. Um, I've got this kind of this question that I'm dying to ask you. Yeah. That I feel like I want to just, I just want to pose it right now, just real quick, because um, I might be jumping ahead because I assume you'll mention um, Black Lunch Table, probably. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think I, I was thinking about that project and then as a, you know, as a, is its own project that, you know, collect, you're collecting oral history. So you're collecting and um, thinking about the archive that way. You're interested in archives anyways, as a researcher. And then over here, you're also making work where there's um, like redaction or removal or erasure happening. And I, um, yeah, I guess I just was was wondering if you had a thought about this. Um, uh, the, yeah. way you, the way you're sort of both working with materials like the iron gall ink that eat away at a substrate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you also have this collaborative project called Black Lunch Table where you're collecting mm -hmm. these around sort of an, an object that symbolizes like eating and, and being in, in community with one another. Mm -hmm. So there's like interesting like, um, is of like eating versus consumption like sustenance versus like consuming mm -hmm. in a negative way or mm -hmm. um that i kind of love like like what is the same and different about feeding ourselves and that going into the body and into the mix versus like redacting or like removing or destroying something that's like eating itself this other way there's, there's sort of like a almost like snake eating its own tail it like comes back around and becomes the other thing <laughs> yeah, no, I, I like that question a lot. Um, I think it's like collection and destruction, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, just, I think in both cases, in any case, there's there's always there's always something missing from the story. There's always something that will be forgotten. There will always be something that's not told, right? And there will be parts and retellings of stories that are always left out, like either on purpose or you know, by design. Um, yeah. Um, I have thought about this question before and I wish that I had an answer for it. I think it's a great one. Um, but I mean, I just, I guess I think about, I mean, maybe there's a kind of agency that comes with like taking, you know, materials out of archives and data from other sources and reprinting them in a way that you know is going to destroy it, right? Um, you know, because normally we don't have that much agency over like what stories remain about us, right? About our work, about our lived experience, right? Um, so like maybe doing that or like, like embedding that into the construction of the work is like, way of owning or like controlling that narrative a little bit and yep. yeah yeah thanks <laughs> like i wish i had more questions i like the questions so or i wish i had more answers sorry <laughs> this is this is this is just con this is a conversation as promised <laughs> no, no total answers necessary I'll, I'll i'm sorry i'll let you keep going oh, I guess I don't have anything to say about this picture. I don't know why it's in here. This is just me looking forward. Um, man, this person, uh, this is Eloise Corba. Uh, I kind of, obsessed is maybe too strong a word, but I was enamored of her um, and her writing in French and German. And I thought it would make more sense if I translated 
translated it and it, it makes a lot less sense in English um, because there's no rhyme, there's no, um, it's not, it's detached from like that space and that place when she was writing it. Um, so I wrote a book about it. Um, and in that book, there's like these translations that are, um, the words are all situated in the way that her writing was. So you can read it. Um, oh, this is fantastic. Yeah. And the, the series of this is printed on um, Stephanie Jemison, who's in New York. I think um, she had a book, a provisional publishing project that, that was called uh, Future Planning Program. And um, my book was one out of a, a series of, I think, a dozen ish books. Um, yeah, and so for my present praxis, this is, this is Sylvan um, at a Moral Mondays rally in North Carolina. Uh, and so, yeah, I think after he was born, my, my practice shifted a lot. Like, I think it had been more caught up in formal concerns. And then I really began to think about like what my role was as a mother that I would have to explain like what the hell is going on in the world to this person soon, <laughs> because he was about to have a lot of questions. Um, and I was thinking about like how to explain like what Moral Mondays were, what the Silent Sam, like the Confederate statue on UNC campus was, what the Confederacy was, what is white supremacy. Um, but I'm thinking about like how to explain those things to like a four or five year old child. Like you really have to think about like what those things mean to you. Um, that's me. That's you. Yeah, it's a little, little dude. <laughs> And think about them in a way that you know, um, you know, is honest, right? Uh, um, there's also me. That's also you. That's in Chicago, though. Mm -hmm. I think that was at uh, the Women's March. Um. Oh yeah, and there's I one this June. one in. There's one June. There's one June, but there. I think which one is Madeline? I still I wear that tank top. That's Madeline Aguilar, um, which is really funny. So this, um, we did this interview. Hold it's on, I and still I used to wear it. We did this interview. Last year I wore it. You did. It was really small. Do you remember when you took that photo? No. No. Is that the perk with Hong An? It's fun. Actually, I think so. Mm -hmm. But um, if we, the parents out there, cultural reproducers, this is a really amazing project. They have, as you can see, a residency report where they talk to parents who have done um, residencies uh, where you can bring your kids um, and or your partners. Like Oxbow and Marble House. Mm -hmm. or Marble House. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those places. Um, and so Krista does interviews with them, but then she also has a huge list of resources. Um, but it is great. And Krista Donner was kind of like, uh, this, like a, I was totally a fangirl of hers. And then we moved here and we met. And I'm Sylvan, friends with Stella. And now Sylvan's friends with her daughter. Um, Stella. Stella, yeah. And I just thought it was funny that Madeline was in here because now she's a grad student in print. Um, and so this text, this piece here, I think it relates back to one of your questions about like parsing text. I think, you know, realizing that there is no possible understanding, like going in a more absurdist direction. Like if I look closer at the text that's in the newspaper, like under a microscope, will it make more sense? I mean, no, obviously, but I mean, maybe there's something to be said in there. Um, so this is called explication de text, which is like close reading. Um, Explanation of the text. Explication, yeah. Yep. Explanation. I just guessed that. That's right. Um, <laughs> and so whenever I would see these texts in the newspaper, um, you know, it would be hard to really consider reading anything else that was in the newspaper. That would be it. Um, so I just wanted to make a newspaper that was only the phrase shot my son. But it's ginormous. It is ginormous. Like you would just see, like, 
this much, mm-hmm. this much of yeah. the O mm-hmm. on a giant piece of paper. And as I was researching for that one, I was looking for some way to degrade text. Like I felt like the text was actually too heavy for the substrate. Um, and I found this uh, substance called Iron Gall Ink. Here's a picture um, from the Iron Gall website um, about localized uh, text degradation. That's where like the ink actually eats into the paper in the shape of the letters. So there are these weird holes. Yep, exactly. And so this piece is a reproduction of a news of four newspaper articles wherein the um, there's a testimony of a mother whose son was a victim of state violence. Um, and will they continue to eat away at? No, the not these. I, I mean, I won't call it cheating, but I accelerated the degradation. So it's like iron gall ink, and then I went over it again with hydrogen peroxide, which like speeds up the degradation. And, and then, and then after that, it's fixed. Like it doesn't. Yeah. No. Um, zoom in. No, I can't zoom in. But basically, there's just holes where the letters were. So. Yeah, I'm surprised you can't see white behind the letters. Well, oh, yeah, over, there you, over there you can. Mm-hmm. It's that the letters are still there. They just fell onto the paper. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there's four of those. Um, and the piece that you guys saw from the drawing rally. And also maybe at the museum. Is uh, the 35 most heavily gerrymandered districts in the country. Um, I think this is... Uh, is all on 18. This is, there are 18 of these. There's 35 of them. It says 18. There are 18. Why do you see 18? I counted them. Oh, well, in this picture, there's 35 total. Um, but anyway, the paper is made from CIL cotton sh- dress shirts, which are like really, really fancy cotton from originally from the CILs, but I think it's no longer grown there. Um, and it's not going, I don't, it's not going to eat through the paper entirely anytime soon. But one thing that's really nice is that it kind of grows these crystals on the outside of it. And that, that's the, like the first image you showed us, but that close up, that kind mm-hmm. of crystal, like, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so now they're in glass, so it'll slow it down a little bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those places where like that form like that does not tell you a whole lot about the lived experience of that place. Um, I mean, the only real thing you need to know about spotting a gerrymandered district is that if it looks kind of crazy. Like it's this pro- one? Yeah, or exactly. Like what's this part? Exactly, what is that part? Like specific? what happened to this? It looks like a bunch of islands. Right, exactly. If it looks fishy, it probably is gerrymandered. <laughs> Someone did that on purpose um, in order to give, you know, one party advantage over another party. Or like what? Oh, wait, happened? and here, this is, I love this image here. This is the, the very first gerrymander. It's named after Governor Elbridge Jerry. Um, and it kind of looks like a... Kind of looks like a, well, it looks more like a dragon than a salamander. Yeah. Yeah. It looks like a, except that the wings are added, or the tongue. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And there, there are no feet, or claws. There are no claws. <laughs> No, that's true. Um, so yeah, that's what they look like up close. So it looked like it looks more like little tiny pieces of cotton mm-hmm. instead of I mean, crystals. The thing that I really like about these is that it really depends on the humidity where they're shown. Like mm-hmm. how they trained. So if it's if you it, really warm mm-hmm. so if you're in north carolina mm-hmm. would probably go fast yeah it's true they do definitely change faster in north carolina or in a basement in the summer mm-hmm. <laughs> and these are this is called fault lines it's currently up at nca um it's the nine states that were formerly protected by the 1965 voting rights act um, and all of the congressional districts since the state's ratification are drawn into it on the back in it hydrogen looks, peroxide. It looks, so. like a, it looks like a map that got drawn mm-hmm. and you can see like where all the city lights are on. Oh yeah, still, a little bit. Mm-hmm. Kind of, mm-hmm. and then that would be a little mm-hmm. But the ocean. 
these places here, that's where this it's going to start falling apart. So where you see the lines, the, the degradation has been accelerated. So I don't know, maybe in a year or two, the whole thing will fall apart. And it'll fall, like you're making this from repurposed cotton materials. You're mm -hmm. making paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this paper is made out of a cotton quilt I got off that. of eBay. Yeah. It took a really long time to take apart. I felt kind of bad. Um, Why? Because <laughs> somebody spent a really long time putting it together. Um, and then when you make those decisions, like when you're choosing something like the quilt that you're going to make the paper out of, are you being really like specific about that too? Like looking for a quilt with certain dates or from certain, you, you want it to be handmade or, you know. Well, I wanted it to be handmade and like the pattern on it was really important, even though like. Um, you're not going to see it. You're not going to see it. I'm the only person that knows that. Um, I, I didn't even know. I didn't even, for a while, I didn't know she made them out of quilts. Interesting. You know, I spent like a year trying to get um, uniforms from a particular specific prison in North Carolina, and I finally got them. And when I went to make paper with them, I realized that they were like 75% synthetic <laughs> which means that yeah. they're like useless you can't really make paper out of them yeah it yeah. wouldn't work on them either it wouldn't well i mean it's just they can't be um like cut up and put into a beater to make pulp um so i still have them if anybody needs any uniforms <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. um I think we, we we were gonna drive out there but we didn't yeah this is it this was at wayne state last uh actually around the time of the election um and it's all the districts in michigan resized and you can kind of see that there's like graph paper in the background um because you did it on a graph there's me mm -hmm. i'm gonna skip ahead of this one black lunch table uh there's heather there's Heather. Where's your mom? There's you. Yep. Do you know any of those other people? Uh, I don't think so. No. Yeah, I can do it. Okay, thanks. Um, so those are the things that we do. We have round tables. That picture there was actually the first one that we ever did. Heather and I had our studios near each other. Where you met? At Skowhegan, where we met. And we okay. noticed that there had never really been a lunch table where all the black people sat like every other cafeteria we'd ever been in um so we decided to invite people to join it um i think at that time we were really interested in like perception so that's why it's called lunch i always it, it's always really late in the day more of dinner <laughs> thanks <Alvin. laughs> so that's it. um and so you know there were we invited everybody heather you know there she is I know, I already said that. Okay. Um, so some of the other folks that were there were the Dean, who was Steve Locke, um, the director, Linda Earl, and Whitfield Lavelle was there. Um, and the rest of us were, you know, residents. Um, but since then, you know, we, we do more uh, organized roundtables where we invite people to come. Um, it's also open to the public. Um, we have one that is the artist table where we invite Black artists um, from the community to come and talk about issues that are related to their life and work there. This one was in Soweto. And we provide prompts based on... Just table number two. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> we provide prompts based on research that we do and then like conversations with the organizers. And you're collecting, you've been actually archiving the conversations on the Black Lunch Table website too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we record all of the audio. The tables are like 60 to 90 minutes long. I'm, I'm the um, recorder suitcase puller yeah, at the airport. I think that would make you like a key grip, right? Is that what the key grip does? Just like um. off. <laughs> <laughs> He's the muscle in this operation. This one was at Dorchester Projects. Um, this one is at the Stone Mental Center. Um, this is from the People's Table at Project Row Houses, where we invite everybody from the community. It's like a similar format, but the questions are like around socio political issues. There's Chicago. 
I don't think that's or Chicago. Somewhere. I, it's a, I thought because it said Chicago first, I was like, oh, there's Chicago. Um, it was fun when we went to Johannesburg. Yeah, it was fun when we went to Johannesburg. <laughs> we already saw this one. Oh, yeah. So We saw that same picture. Yeah, so we record everything. Stop, Sullivan. We record everything, um, transcribe everything. We have a team of metadata taggers and working with somebody who's building the archive and our archive currently looks like this so you'd be able to search for we can um, update a little, little bit metadata <laughs> good. um right now there's like 12 um oh. tables worth of audio up um and if you click on any particular metadata tag it'll show you what other subjects those oh, are linked to okay. and then on the side you can click uh, on the audio links uh -huh, and you can play a specific set of audio good that's confusing. Let's skip it. <laughs> an editor <laughs> We do Wikipedia editor Where is that one? Um, Project Row Houses in Houston. Oh, yeah. I was thinking it might have been in Nashville. Couldn't is that tell. Ryan? Yeah, that's Ryan. Where? <laughs> Where? You don't, I can't believe you don't remember Ryan. Sylvan and Ryan were like besties. <laughs> Where? <laughs> yeah, I can see that. <laughs> Where? They got, they got some of the same energy, maybe. <laughs> um so we, there's a lot of reasons we edit one of them is to shift the de demographic um but you know uh wikipedia editors edit what they feel comfortable editing um and what they're interested in editing so there's a lot of subject matters that are underdeveloped like black artists um yeah you can change it uh there's yeah. MoMA and that Momani. Yeah, we do collaborations with other groups like in feminism and New York crowd and who's knowledge. Um, I'm guessing that's on Staten Island. No, I can't tell. It's not. It looks like it. Yeah, thanks. Next. Okay. This um, is a video. This is a video. So we have a very long task list, which is always growing. I think there's like 1300 artists. Um, the artists are generally from the if you're if it's red, they don't have with. a website. If, yeah, exactly. If it's red, that means they don't have an article. I'm um, gonna put the arrow on top of this arrow. But here. of course, like even the <laughs> blue ones, you know, they still need constant updating. Um, uh, we also have a photo initiative where we are visit. We are like literally everywhere creating or improving <laughs> the visibility of black artists on wikipedia and so we're back um so we this is actually arishia bennett who's here in chicago um Ooh. did did you remember arishia okay. yeah we ran into her i couldn't tell um didn't know hear them um and uh we invite artists from the community to come have their photos taken the photos are uploaded to wiki commons and this is what i'm currently working on um so wait can you go between the next and this one Sylvan? so i there is a set of i think there's 67 drawings done by wb du bois and collaborators um and they were created for the 1900 paris exposition um they're really amazing and are all available on the Library of Congress. Um, but the project I'm working on right now is looking back at the drawings from- We have those hung up in the studio. Yeah, 100 plus years ago. And I'm um, thinking about like using the same visual languages, but with new data. So basically I'm just recreating these drawings, but with data that is current to see how much it changes. So, I have been working with uh, data.census.gov website. And For your class. Yeah, in my class. We had uh, some folks from the census come visit with us and show us how to pull APIs. And then you also made that design on the graph, and I which also, I helped you. Thank you. <laughs> you I suggested a bunch. Um, I remember uh, that one. Yeah. The relative Negro population in the United States. For Chicago. Chicago is right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. So. You, that's the one. That's the one I helped you make. Oh no, you did help me make that. I did. Thanks. Mm -hmm. so, so looking at where there are the highest country concentrations of. And um, then we made a remake of remodel. Back. We made like that remodeled. Can you, can you go back? Thanks. But we made a remodel of that. Yes. Can you also. go? Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Are these translated into um, prints or works on paper again, or is this uh, a moment where you're staying in the digital? Or I uh, know so I'm actually so I'm just doing all these as mockups right now, and then I'm going, the next phase is actually drawing. Mom, you had to show off. Alaska. And so recreating. I did forget to show Alaska. Um, <laughs> the last step is recreating all the drawings and. Um, like and, we did with this one. I've been working with uh, Meg Duguid at uh, Columbia College and um, yeah. we're at the park. Yes, we met at the park. Um, I'm having a show of all of these in the fall. So got a lot of work still to do on all of this, but actually we just collaborated on an essay for the MIT Thresholds Journal, just talking about you know, the process of, you know, doing, undertaking a project like this and like its significance right now. I'm going to open up uh, our conversation to our audience to ask questions because I know we are coming up on our um, time for the evening. So I just want to invite anybody in our in our participant in our audience to throw some questions in the chat box that you might have for Gina. Oh, and this is the this is the remodel of this one. Yep. Thank you, Sophie. Um, oh yeah, and I guess this was just if there are any any, any skill sharing that you want me to do, I, or that you guys are interested in, um, how and where to wiki. Uh, Go to wiki. Think making resources, mm -hmm. census data, search resources, API polling. Free. <laughs> <laughs> Andrea Herrick wants to know if you use a standardized blank postcard template. Oh, yes. You can also just get uh, like blank postcards from Blick. Oh my god. Oh, no, I just wanted to, to stop sharing screen. Oh, I know how. Oh, okay, thanks. Um, but I, oh. Oh, thanks. Uh, I'm pretty sure I know how. Hmm. Well then. I got it. One sec. <laughs> Hmm. Stop share. Thank you. Done. <laughs> You're welcome. I have another question for you, but I'm. Well, I think we have seven minutes left before we would have been at the hour and a half mark. So I will um, let anybody else kind of pipe in. You can throw a question in the chat, or you can ask it. You can turn on your mic, turn off your mute, and ask a question if you want to too. I have a question. Um, hi, Michael. Yes, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, that ink that you were using that eats away at paper. One um, was <clears throat> was that um, was that ink made to be used like ink, and um, yeah. it's just because like it eats away at paper, so it's like kind of contradicts ink on paper. And also, like, how did you come across? That just seems like a very, very, very specific um, ink, and I didn't know about it until now. So, yeah, I mean, I think people stopped using it because they realized that it's like <laughs> it eats your paper. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but no, I think it was actually very common. Um, I just put a, a uh, link in the chat there to Iron Girl Ink. But um, I think it how was, to make it properly. Yeah, and how to make it properly. Um, I said prob probably. The problem with it is that a lot of folk recipes have too much iron in them, um, which rusts faster. And when it rusts, apparently it also makes um, sulfuric acid, which of course you know is dangerous and eats stuff. So that's why it eats the paper. <laughs> 
but it's actually it is really cool um i got to hang out with a lot of like people who are working in paper restoration just talking about like you know best practices for slowing down the degradation which is really interesting and they were like why are you doing this <laughs> why would you want to work with us um because they're trying to figure out how to preserve you know documents manuscripts that have been used with IRAC mm -hmm. and all. Mm -hmm. So you're using a higher strength iron gall ink than what maybe was used. In yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, I put extra iron in mine so that it, it rests a little bit faster. But I can show you it. Yeah. It. Michael, if you're looking at the website there, there's a section that's on make ink. And the one that I make, it's the two week kind. It says you're supposed to let your, your galls soak for a fortnight. <laughs> it's two weeks. Can you play for can you play for the night room? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. And you can play Fortnite during that while you're waiting. Great. <laughs> oh, a question from the Louis. Raised his hand, I think. Lordy Rodriguez has a question. Lordy. Hey, Gina. Hey, Lordy. Nice to see you. I have hey. a good question. Um, the, the work where you are taking contemporary data and I'm using older visual language, yeah. is that correct? If I'm interpreting yeah. that right? Um, is there any um, reason for how far back you go? Like, is there a, um, a visual language, let's say, 80 years ago for, from, um, that you're appropriating to display this information that may skew that information as opposed to information or a language taken from the 50s? Uh, so the, the WB Du Bois drawings, we can kind of put this link in the chat also. Why do you put a link in the chat? No, this is something different. So um, it actually, I was doing the research on this other project and I was like, man, I don't know if anyone will ever care about these drawings I just made. They are like literally just drawings of weather reports. Like, is that boring? <laughs> Has anybody done anything like this before? Um, and as I was researching that, I came upon W.B. Du Bois's um, like infographics. Um, and I thought they were really beautiful and fascinating. And there since has been a book that just came out about them. Um, apologies for linking from Amazon, but here you go. Um, but it's W.B. Du Bois's data portrait, so. You can also get it on your Kindle if you want. Yes, or get it from another source. Or get it on, a Kindle, on the Kindle <laughs> app, I guess. But yeah, so basically I'm just remaking the W.B. Du Bois's drawings, right? but with contemporary data. So he had like things like, you know, um, like educational attainment of Negroes in the United States. So like, what does that look like in 2020? Um, or you already did that. renters versus landowners or um, like indentured servants, um, church, I think there's one about religion, um, black newspapers, which would be really interesting too, because there's definitely, well, actually, there's probably less print newspapers, black print newspapers now than there was, you know, 120 years ago. So it's kind of just like using that visual Printing language black ink. and using, um, updating it with new data. You mean by printed with black ink? No, I mean, there were black people who were, I have to be more specific. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I was very curious where you're pulling the visual languages from. Yeah. So not my own. And I know there's a number of artists who have done projects with that um, collection of drawings. Like um, Theaster Gates did one where he took out all of the data. So it's just like these modernist drawings. I was like, yeah, that's backwards. Like, <laughs> the data you know, is really interesting. Um, or, uh, oh my gosh, why am I forgetting your name? Um, 
Don't smack the table. I have to think. There is another artist. Dude. Don't smack the table. Okay. Thank you, Sylvan. Um, Let me see if I can find her. Um, Are there any questions while I'm working? Gina, um, Sarah put a question in the chat box to you. Mm -hmm. um, she asks, I know that Dubois showed photographs alongside the data portraits. Do you see these functioning on their own or in context with other kinds of images? Yeah, and I haven't really figured out what to do with those. Like, I mean, I think ideally I would recreate the entire exhibition um, with updated materials. Um, and if I had, you know, a year or two to spend with it, I would love to like work with, um, you know, like an urban planning team at, at like the university in Georgia who could help me with the research and like with all of that. Um, so, I mean, maybe for now it's like a sketch. Um, I mean, I think the other thing that is kind of an unknown is like the 2020 census, right? Like it wasn't, um, I mean, they did better, I think, than they expected to, but I think the response rate was like 67%, somewhere around there. Yeah, so there's a lot of people missing. Um, yeah. But the, the data.census.gov site is amazing. Um, they have like so many tutorials on how to search for really specific things um, and to do to find like microdata about small communities. So like if we wanted to research Edgewater, which is where we live in Chicago, we could find out information about Three Edgewater. Minutes. Oh, thanks. Actually, no. <laughs> Negative two minutes. Are you over? Okay. <laughs> All right, Sullivan, clock watch. <laughs> Three minutes. Three minutes. 7.45. We were pretty good. Um, I mean, it's hard, it's, hard to, it's hard not to just keep talking when there's a lot of things to, to hear about. And and I have a question for you about memory, but I'll just save it for an opportunity when I can have Grog with you in person. Yeah. Do you have any uh, do you have questions for Sullivan? Can you tell us what your favorite thing to do at Oxbow was? Hmm. Maybe before we cut. I don't know. Hmm. Was it the work crew or ringing the dinner bell? I like I like doing both. Okay. I have a question for you, Sylvan. Mm -hmm. I just learned how to do lithography myself just this year, and it sounds like you just learned how to do lithography. What do you? Yeah. Like about, what did you um, like about lithography? What did you like about working with Annie? Well, I mean. When I did it, I did it. I didn't know really what I was gonna draw. So I just either. <laughs> <It's true. laughs> I just drew it I did, and then it came out like this. Mm -hmm. That's really nice. It's abstract. Or yeah. There. Movement. That movement. I think that's one of the cool things about lithography is getting to draw on the stone is such an amazing And I'm like, pretty sure I all I think I also use paint. Hmm. I think you can it doesn't this doesn't like here like this doesn't really this looks more like paint mm -hmm. than crayon mm -hmm. yeah but also I, I don't think i use black crayon liquid cartouche that's what it's called oh, maybe you know we should do a talk with you and danny that guys can talk about your practice okay <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I feel like probably um, I, I think at this point, Sylvan might know more about lithography than I do. So <laughs> um, I'd like to hear his perspective on it a little bit more. <laughs> um, well, in respect of everybody's time, you and I know we're over. Thank you, Sylvan, for watching the clock. Um, I just uh, want to say thank you to both of you for spending Wednesday evening with us. One minute. The Hey, okay, give us two minutes. <laughs> One, um, it's thank you for uh, spending your Wednesday evening with us and talking about your time at Oxbow and about your practice and answering my questions and everybody else's questions and, and just um, giving us this opportunity to get to know you better. Yeah, thank you everybody for coming and Shannon, thanks for all the questions. It's a lot to think about. Um, I have so many more questions, you know, I hope <laughs> 
and like I said, have Grog in person sometime in the future. <laughs> yeah, I think I'll just have a marshmallow. That's what I want. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I want a marshmallow. <laughs> <laughs> um folks who are here and uh thanks for coming um we do record our oxtail ugh, oxtails and cocktails talks and put them up on our website so if um there's something that you saw or you heard that you want to hear again it will be up on our website in probably about a week or so thank you thank you sierra for um coordinating and hosting us tonight Thank you everyone for coming out. I hope everyone enjoys their evening. Stay warm if you're in the Midwest or Texas. Shout out to Texas right now and places down south. Um, have a good night, everyone. Check back in with us. We also have a code if you'd like to get a discount on our glasses. It's the code OXTOX. You can get some of our lovely glasses made um, in our glass studio and those will be available for your next oxtails and cocktails talk so you can drink oh, i want to help people. next time i go all right let's get it <laughs> awesome thanks everyone have a good night good night goodbye good night. bye